Generic teching tumble. Woo! Yes, that was a normal thing that I do on my videos as I tumble on my bed. Hi everyone, my name is teching and today we'll we be discussing a one piece related topic something that i have done on the channel many times before and i hope you will enjoy it will probably involve me mentioning boobs at some point because i like characters that have big breasts you know because that's just me ha 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 okay i think we're clean all right i can get in a lot of trouble by spilling the beans here okay but i gotta come clean to you guys all right my real name isn't matthew crawford no it's michael glawford and i've been part of a secret government operation for the last three years now code name c4sh carrot four straw hat see there are people out there in the world that think carrot is the single most adorable anime character ever and she deserves to be straw hat no matter the cost you think you could stop us you can't we got some of the most influential people in the world on this nux talk Animac, King of Lightning, Roger's Base. I think we're working on Joy Boy right now. Even Arator is falling to our cause. Spilling out carrot propaganda 24-7. That's our ultimate goal. So, if you want to join, here's what you do. Go out and find yourself a rabbit. If you already own a pet rabbit, well, you're already halfway there. But if you don't, you're going to have to go get creative. Find a rabbit, get close, whisper in its ear, I know your secret. And of course, the rabbit's going to have to give a background check. It's going to have to vet you a little bit. But if the rabbit thinks you're worthy... He will then lead you to the secret meeting spot. I will look forward to seeing you in action, comrade. That's our that's our salute that we do. It's kind of redundant because we all wear bunny ears as part of the, you know, operation, but still, we have it. Okay, and with that information out of the way, my life is probably in jeopardy right now, and I should probably be making my way to the nearest safe house. But first, I gotta go over the latest Vivera card. Vivera card, number 11. Classified documents. This is some carrot-sensitive material in here, okay? So, thanks to Secret Agent Artor for leaking the hot news here. I'm like, oh my god, she's right on the front page. He knows where it's at. This isn't actually the front page. This is like the fifth page in, but I don't always print out everything relating to, like, character birthdays or favorite foods or anything like that. But first, before we even get to Carrot and the other characters, I wanted to talk about some ages, all right? So we got some neat ages this time around. So first thing that uh, we didn't know about is Carrot is in fact only 15 years old, so uh, that's the re well, part of the reason why hashtag not a furry is a thing. There you go. Now you know why. Um, although I will ask, is that like bunny ears or I mean bunny ears or is that human ears? Is it the same? Oh, okay, you know what? It's probably best just to avoid it. Um, Weevil is 35 years old, and the reason that that's relevant is because we learned that Whitebeard and Bakin were part of the same crew at one point around 40 years ago. We didn't get an exact number, but when Marco was explaining it to Nekamamushi, he was like, oh yeah, Bakin and Whitebeard, they were on the same crew back in the day 30, you know, probably closer to 40 years ago. So we do know that Weevil was born 35 years. So I don't think it's the situation where Whitebeard and Bakin got it on and, you know, Weevil is his legitimate son that way. Um, you know, but if it were to happen, this, this, the time frames would line up. So maybe that's just Oda's way of keeping us guessing a little bit while longer. Like, did they get together? I don't know. Um, Bakin herself is 76, making her two years older than Whitebeard. Whitebeard was 72 when he died at Marineford, which meant that she would have been 74 back during the time of Marineford two years ago. And now she's 76 when Whitebeard would have been 74 if he was still alive. But, you know, he died. Um, Inari Kashi and Nekamamushi are the same age, age 40. Jack is 28 years old, which means that during the invasion of Wano, when Kaido and Orochi took over the place, Jack would have only been 8 years old. Although, keep in mind, something we're going to learn about Jack in this data book makes sense why, even though he was so young, he was still able to be like a, a strong fighting force, even at that tender age of 8. So, just sidestep on that for a minute. We'll get back to that. Um, we get to the names of some of the uh, musketeers. We knew Sicilian was the main musketeer. Here. He was the strongest one, but we also have revealed the names of the zebra, who is Giovanni, and the fox, who is Consulat. So that's always interesting to know because they were the three musketeers. That was the basis for their character designs, but we only got the name of one of them, Sicilian. So I was interested in that. We got Giovanni and Consulat, hence because of Lancelot. So that's a pretty cool name. And Giovanni, that just makes me think of Pokemon, so that's fine. Um, Victoria Sindri, you know, she was the zombie that was Hogback's little, uh, you know, assistant on Thriller Bark. She was a famous dancer, and she died at age 24, and so that was 12 years ago. We actually get a date for how old she was when she died, and also how long ago it was. So that 
that's interesting to note there. Ryuma was 47 when he died, so that's something there. Ryuma, we're gonna find out later on, he was referred to as, like, the best swordsman in the history of Wano. This was touched upon a little bit in the manga, like, Ryuma, like, as, when we got to Wano, I figured Ryuma was a famous figure of the, of the past, you know, he was, like, one of their national heroes, but no, one of his titles was literally just the sword god. Okay, so he wasn't just one of the best swordsmen in Wano's history. No, he was, like, the best. He was, like, the samurai that every samurai comes after him wants to be like him. Okay, that's how important Ryuma was, which also makes the, you know, the um, defiling of his grave and the stealing of his body and Shusui all the more heinous in the people of Wano's eyes. So there's that. Haradis, the wizard on Weatheria that Nami, you know, learned weather science from, was 97 years old, making him the second oldest uh, human character next to Kareha. Kareha is currently 141. There are, of course, characters that are way older than Kareha and Haradis, but these are just humans we're talking about here. 97. But the old man still got around, despite living at high altitudes. Maybe that's a, you know, secret to good health or something. If you live 7,000 meters up, it's just, I don't know, you get used to breathing more heartily, I guess. I don't know. Heracles, mm, Heracleson. His name is just Heracles, but I'm going to keep saying Heracleson because it's just so much fun. He's 50 years old. Uh, Ors is 159 when he died about 500 years back. We also got some new information on Ors. His height was retconned. I mentioned this in the Zunisha video. He used to be 39 meters and now he's 67 meters. So Oda kind of beefed him up a little bit there. We'll be getting to Ors. Um, Jack, these are going on to like character heights now. Jack is 8 meters, 8.3 meters, which makes him slightly shorter than Big Mom. Big Mom was 8.8 .8 meters, but still a lot taller than Kaido himself, so just use that for reference. Uh, Weevil is 6.8 meters. Keep in mind, Whitebeard was only 6.6. .6. In fact, Whitebeard was 6.66 meters. 666. I know in Japan and in other countries, the 666 is not always like a symbol of bad luck or like a connection to the devil, but in the United States, in this kind of culture, it is. And it's just kind of funny because you know what happened to him. It's bad luck. Well, look what happened. But no, yeah, Weevil is slightly taller than Whitebeard uh, and also uses a reference. Katakuri was around five meters tall. So Jack and Weevil there and Whitebeard, they were all taller than Katakuri. And Katakuri was already a pretty tall dude. Big Mom was 8.8 .8 meters. And keep in mind that the shortest giants are 12 meters, as a reference. I bring this point up because remember Vice Admiral Bastille? That dude with the giant saw, the, you know, Nokogiri. And he has, like, the, um, you know, the, the mask on that got crushed by Sabo at Dressrosa. It was actually stated in a previous data book that that dude was, in fact, a giant. Uh, but he's only 2.91 meters tall, so I think that also had to be retconned. You know, I don't get too upset by this kind of stuff, because at the end of the day, character heights, I mean... They matter, I guess, when you're really big, but in the case of just, like, you know, a really tall character, you know, like, Bastille was nine feet tall. I mean, for a human, that's really tall, but, you know, when you're talking about giants and stuff, so it's fine. Maybe Oda really hadn't made up his mind yet at that point, like, what constitutes a giant, but then he started introducing characters like Big Mom, Kaido, Jack... Katakuri, and, you know, somebody asked him a question in SBS, like, how tall is Big Mom? What is the, like, how tall do you have to be to be considered a giant? And I think that's when Oda finally had to sat, uh, sit down and come up with, like, okay, I need to come up with a hard number here, like, you have to be, you know, 12 meters tall to be considered a giant as a bare minimum. All right, and so later on, he just, I guess, retconned it when it came to Bastille. He is no longer considered a giant. But that's just something, character ages and heights, I wanted to bring up. Okay, moving on to our favorite character. Our favorite character. <laughs> I'm so clever. All right, so the big thing here, it doesn't reveal anything about her being a straw hat, which... Okay, look, fingers crossed, I was hoping for something best-case scenario, but, I mean, come on now, this is, uh, this is a data book, we're not gonna find out any, like, earth-shattering information about something that important, like, if there was gonna be a new straw hat, you know, beyond Jinbei, I don't think that would be revealed in a data book or an SBS, like, Oda would want that to be revealed in the canon of the manga first, I mean, that just makes sense there. Here is something that is a little weird that Artur discovered, and I probably would have never noticed this even if I was fluent in Japanese and I was even buying the Vivera cards on a weekly basis, not a weekly, a monthly basis. I probably wouldn't have even noticed this, okay? So good on you, Artur. He's doing just detective works here. You know, he was, he was part of the CIA for 12 years, so it makes sense that he was able to come up with this. 
I'm sorry, Artur. I'm just building an entire backstory for your character. All right, so all of the different... All of the different Viva cards are color-coded. I have just the first pack here, okay? So just the Straw Hats. But you can see the Straw Hats are colored red. Um, there are, I think I know I have Roger and Shanks. Shanks is a slightly darker shade of red. Uh, EX cards are blue. Roger's in here. He's orange. Okay, so that's the point. Like, every group that's represented by Vivra cards has a slightly different color, even if it's only off by a slight shade. Like, the Straw Hat's color red and Shanks' color red, slightly different, okay? Here's the point with this. The Minks are colored green, except for Carrots. Hers is a slightly off color green. It's still green, but it's just weird that literally every other mink, every other character that's part of the, um, you know, the uh, the Mukamaro Dukedom. Is that how it is? Mukamaro Dukedom? I think it's the first time I've ever said that word. All their cards are the exact same shade of green, except for carrots. Now, this doesn't prove anything. This doesn't prove that, oh, she's going to be 100% part of the Straw Hats or the Beast Pirates. That's another theory that's out there. Or she's going to join some other faction. Artur even checked his deck that he got with other, you know, people that got the Vivra cards, and they're all the same, and since, like, the carrots are always off-color just a little bit. So, it's not like a misprint, like, the pack that Artur got was, like, errored or something. Now, I'm thinking about this, and it's still not impossible it could be an error, because maybe when they were printing all of the Vivra cards, um, there just happened to be that error across the board, and they figured, like, nobody would notice, like, who knows? Maybe when they were printing the Vivra cards, they ran out of that particular color of green ink, and they printed them anyway, and they were like, ah, who cares, nobody will notice, it's just a slight difference, and we're just taking this and putting our tinfoil hats on and just going crazy bonkers with it. But, it's a chance, it's a hope, you know, don't take this away from me, alright? So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it might lead into something more, I always hope that she's going to join, I've made my opinion of this known a million times over by now. Also, it's not just because she traveled with the Straw Hats, like, to Totland, because Pedro also has the exact same shade as Green of green as all the other uh, minks on Zo. All right, so it's not like, oh, hers is a slightly different color because she traveled with the Straw Hats. Well, Pedro did too, and Pedro was kind of a member of his own little, you know, clique as well, uh, the Knox Pirates. So, you know, it, it seems something only limited to carrots. So that gives, like, it puts her aside from all the other minks. So I don't know if that just means, like, oh, that's the one Oda wants to kind of focus on. Like, that's the, that's kind of the, uh, the poster girl of the minks is carrot, because she is. But okay. So beyond that, though, I don't really think there's any crazy information about Carrot. Uh, it talks about her training in the Musketeers, like when Pedro gave her her gauntlets and everything. Her training and all that stuff did not take place too long ago. Uh, it wasn't like she was a little, little kid. Um, in fact, when we find out her age, it's like she was 15. She was only maybe a few months younger when she got her gauntlets and she was being trained to be a Musketeer and everything. So it probably was between six months and a year from you know when she met the Straw Hats that she began training. So look at Carrot is kind of like a prodigy in that respect how she was able to like jump in the air and master her sulong at such a young age she is essentially like the toshiro hitsugaya i guess that's a weird reference but it's the first one that popped up on my head she's like a young prodigy that can master sulong and everything probably better than the other minks could or a lot quicker than the other minks could like toshiro could master his bonkai at a young age same deal with carrot and her sulong there um, you know, uh, there's some talk here about her hairstyle. Oda was going to give her a little bit of a different hairstyle, but he always wanted her to be happy and a cheerful kind of character. Could this be because he's, uh, thinking like, oh, all right, I want to make her a happy and cheerful character so she's better at deceiving people and letting their guard down before she takes out the knife and... Maybe. I'm not throwing that idea out there. I'm just throwing that idea out there. All right, but that's Carrot. All right, so moving on, I could spend the rest of the video doing that, but, you know, we, we got to move on. There's a lot of characters in this pack. Okay, Wanda. Uh, Wanda might be related to Inurashi, as in might be his daughter, which makes a lot of sense. They're both part of the same exact, uh, you know, species of mink and that they're dogs, they're canines. Although I think Oda even came out and talked about how the genetics work with the minks. It's kind of the same deal with the fishmen and the mer folk in that you could have an octopus fishman and a great white shark merman and get together and have a kid and it could be a freaking clownfish fishman 
you know, it, it's not actually, like, completely related to the parents, not necessarily. I think it's the same deal with a mink. You could have a horse get together with a freaking sheep, and you could have a cow. And it's not like a, what, what did you do the other, <laughs> it's nothing like that. It's just normal. It's just what happens. But she might be, like, actually blood-related to Inurashi in the sense, like, closely related to him, like, daughter or niece or something like that. So just keep that in mind. Um, by the way, Wanda's name actually comes from the Japanese onomatopoeia that dogs, you know, make. So in America, it's or in English, it's bark, bark is the sound dogs make. In Japanese, it's wan, wan. And so that's Wanda. Um, yeah, nothing really much else about Wanda. Just talks about her, you know, first in encounter with Nami and everybody after, you know, Jack attacked the minks and everything. She was very cautious at first. She kind of vented her frustrations at Nami, but they became BFFs after too long. So good for Wanda. There's Zunisha. Now, I did a whole video on that, so I'm just pretty much going to go over that, uh, you know, just very briefly here. I did want to bring up a few things I forgot to mention in that video, though. Um, so, a lot of people brought up, because, you know, Zunisha's 35... Thousand meters tall 35 kilometers tall and even if you take away the part that's under the water That's still like 25 kilometers up. That's even higher than Sky Islands um, People brought up that scene when Luffy just grabbed everybody and you know jumped off the side of the elephant like all right guys Let's go. Yeah <laughs> Everyone's like okay, so they survived that did they now? Um, well keep in mind Luffy is made of rubber so he could literally just turn into a parachute on their way down That's still would have not made it any less terrifying for Carrot and Nami and Brooke and everybody. Like, he just grabs them and just jumps off the side of an elephant like, oh no! Like, that would have I, I'm not gonna calculate that because I don't think I know enough information. I guess if you calculate the weights and heights for all the different characters, you could calculate how long it would take that fall to happen, but falling from, uh, I think it was like 15 and a half miles up that's going to take a while to hit the ground, I would assume. But I'm assuming Luffy turned into a parachute, you know, before too long. But still, they were, like, hearts were, like, pumping out of their chest by the time they finally got to the, uh, Sunny. And also, uh, this is probably the most important part of that Zunisha video I left out. Um, I was going to tell an elephant joke that, uh, my sixth grade homeroom teacher, Mr. Simmons, told us once, and I forgot to do it, so allow me to enlighten you now. In the memory of Mr. Simmons! I don't know if he's dead or not, but he was really old when he taught me, and this was, like, back in 2004, so if you're still alive, way to go, Mr. Simmons, you're an awesome teacher. If, well, even if you're not still alive, way to go, Mr. Simmons, you're an awesome teacher. Like, I don't know, my, my opinion would change him, him if he died? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. All right, no, no, here's the joke, here's the joke. Okay, you ready for this? Okay. What do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? You ready? Okay. Elephino! Yeah, I was like 12 when I first heard that, and I still didn't think it was all that funny. But, you know, I got a chuckle out of it. Okay, okay. Long live Mr. Simmons. Okay, so, uh, moving on now. That's everything else about Zunisha I covered in the video of relevance involving its height. Moving on to Jack. Jack is a full fishman. Yeah. 100% purebred fisherman, not half fisherman like we figured, like Derringer. We figured he was, because he fell in the water and he didn't drown. He could breathe. He was a devil fruit user, so he was immobilized. He couldn't move. He had to be rescued, but he could breathe, okay? So, I just thought, all right, well, most fishermen that we see end up having, like, you know, skin that's, like, you know, some crazy color, like blue or green or, like, a really bright shade of yellow or something, right? So, Jack had, like, normal like flesh colored skin so I figured all right he might be half fishman like Derringer that would sink up he has the teeth that he keeps hitting with that mask but no he is actually a brindle bass fishman now also keep in mind like you know there's parts of his body we don't get to see it's not like Jack rips off all of his clothes and we get to see every part of him you know he has like a jacket on we can see his like his huge like you know chest and everything like that and his abs and all that stuff but in terms of like his pants and stuff he might take off his pants and his whole you know bottom half of his body might be covered in scales and might be bright blue. We, we don't know. Um, but yeah, it is confirmed that he is a brindle bass fisherman. If you don't know what a brindle bass looks like, there you go. I think it fits him quite well. Um, so that's how he was able to stay alive. Um, and that's also probably the reason why even at only age eight, he was able to kind of be a strong fighting force on the Beast Pirates. Does it say he was an all-star? At some point, Jack joined the Beast Pirates and at a later point, he was eventually promoted to all-star. Okay, so... 
it's implied that he wasn't there from the very inception of the crew. Like, when Kaido founded the Beast Pirates, he wasn't there. He probably wasn't even born yet if Kaido's, like, around his 60s, same age as Big Mom. That's what we're assuming. We don't know Kaido's age yet. Um, he probably joined up later. He might have joined up right around the time they were invading Wano because of how young he was and just because of his brutality and raw strength as a young child when he grew up. Probably by the time he was, like, a teenager, he was probably really powerful. Maybe around this time is when he got the uh, the ancient Zozo no Mi model mammoth, and this is the time he became an all-star, okay? And it also states that, um, you know, he is not very uh, expressive when it comes to his brothers, the queen and king, which, by the way, we're not really sure if, I guess they're not, you know, actual brothers. I mean, if that was the case, king and queen would also have to be fishmen or half fishmen in some way, uh, which, who knows, they, they might be. Probably not, but we always thought Jack looked fairly human, so we don't know at this point. I don't know what's real anymore, Oda. Um, but, uh, yeah, when it comes to them, though, he's, like, the weakest, and he also kind of gets berated and beaten down by king and queen, like, probably verbally and physically before, so that's why he's very submissive when it comes to them. Um, let's see here. He doesn't have hockey, so that's something else. Maybe king and queen have hockey, and they know how to use it, and they're like, oh, Jack, you freaking silly goose. You don't even have hockey. Freaking Jack the, dra the drag down. Am I right, king? Yeah, I'm right about that. We don't really got much for King's personality yet. He's kind of a sadist. He's kind of into the whole BDSM thing, but we don't really know much about King yet. All right, we got some information on Sheep's Head or Sheep's Head. Is it Sheep's Head or Sheep's Shed? Either way could make sense to me. Sheep's Head because he literally makes sheep antlers, you know, to attack with sheep horns or sheep shed because sheep tend to shed. So either way makes sense. But um, yeah, we find out his favorite food are vegetables. Yeah, it's not really important. Oh, actually, you know what? Something about him that is interesting. So, he is a headliner who is kind of in charge of other headliners. So that implies, even in the headliners, even when we're not talking about the six flying captains, which are like the highest rank of headliner, there might very well be another echelon of headliner. It might be a seniority thing. It might be like, you know, well, I guess not a seniority thing because Drake just joined in the last two years. But maybe the six flying captains are like a separate thing. It might be like when there's two headliners in one area on one mission, like Sheep's Shed might be like, you know, I've been a headliner for six years and Gene Rummy has only been a headliner for one year. So he's kind of her senior. So he gets to kind of like command her around if it's necessary. Uh, but yeah, they were both in fact headliners. But yeah, that's everything involving Sheep's Head slash Shed. Moving on to the thriller bark uh, clique. This is something interesting. So Gecko Mori's bounty was 320 million before it got frozen and he got entered into the Warlords. He was then since basically fired from the Warlords. He was kicked out. They attempted to kill him, but he managed to survive. Um, so his bounty might actually be higher at this point, but he got that first bounty of 320 million before he even fought Kaido. All right. And it tries to link a lot of things up here from the relation of Moria and Kaido. I like that Oda's doing this. Moria was not part of the story for a very, very long time, um, and all of a sudden he's incorporating him back into it, basically just because Moria did fight against Kaido. That was something that was revealed at Thriller Bark. So you could see, like, you know, Oda could just ignore that and never mention it again, and I think the plot of the story would progress perfectly fine, but no, I think Oda really wants to expand upon that. That's why he had Moria show up in that arc, uh, that little buffer chat chapter in between Act 1 and 2 with Blackbeard on the Honeycomb Island. Like, yeah, he wants to incorporate Moria into this because he does have a connection to Kaido. So, he fought Kaido at Wano, the same place he retrieved Ryuma and Shusui. Uh, also, after this defeat by Kaido's hand, he retreated back to the West Blue, which is where he was from. All of the Thriller Bark clique were from the West Blue, I believe. Absalom and Hogback were also from there. I'm not sure about Perona. I think she was. They were all from the West. Um, and so... I'm going to assume maybe what happened was Moria went to Wano to retrieve Ryuma and Shusui because he heard legends about them and wanted them for his zombie army. And then that's when Kaido showed up and beat the crap out of him and wiped out the majority of his crew. And Moria was just barely able to get back, get out alive, mentally traumatized by all of the losses he suffered. But he still managed to retrieve Ryuma or Shusui. Because if that's not the case, that would mean... Like if they if he did not get Ryuma and fight Kaido at the same moment, that means he would have had to leave after getting his ass kicked by Kaido and then come back to Wano, which does not seem like something he would do after getting his ass kicked the first time. You know what I mean? So I think it had to happen at the same time. Uh, no explanation on how he got Thriller Bark, an island in the West Blue, into the first half of the Grand Line, which I was kind of also... I didn't think it was going to be in here, but I was kind of hoping it might have been, you know? Um... 
But yeah, so that's that. Um, you know what I feel about Moria? I feel like we see him during Roger's execution. So I think what happened in his younger years, he might have had the Kage Kage no Mi, and he was inspired by Roger to become King of the Pirates. And for the first few years when he was trying to be a pirate, he was actually going for the gusto. He wasn't as lazy as we see him in the current story. He was going for it, using his zombies, using his shadow powers to kind of amass an army, but he wasn't just staying on one island just gathering power. He was just charging through paradise, charging through the new world, and then he hit a roadblock. That roadblock's name is Kaido. Kaido beats the crap out of him, and then and after that, after he was traumatized after losing his crew, I'm sure he had, you know, he had zombies on his crew maybe back then, but he also had regular crewmates. That's when he decided to say, screw it, I'm just going to build up an entire uh, pirate crew of nothing but zombies, so that way I can't lose anybody anymore. And I think he just, over the years, became more slothful and just kind of kept putting it off, like, yeah, when we get to 100 zombies, I'll try to take over the new world again. And then he gets to 100, he's like, well... Yeah, I really don't want to go back there. I kind of just like chilling out on my island. Well, when we get to 500 zombies, okay, maybe a thousand zombies. He just kept putting it off and letting the zombies and the other members of the Mysterious Four handle everything, and it just that led into uh, his slothful lifestyle. But um, yeah, who's to say what Mori is up to right now? Looking forward to the future. I mean, they might just uh, kill him and take his power, or they might keep him alive for his power. Not really sure. So that's the thing with Moria. Absalom is confirmed to be 100% dead as a doornail. So for those of you that were still holding out for Absalom to cling to life. Nope. Absolutely confirmed to be dead, and Shiryu took his fruit. So, good night, sweet prince, lion, lion prince. But that doesn't mean he's gone forever, because, of course, Moria has the power to literally resurrect the dead. And I think Davon even said, like, do you want his body back? So they could just chuck his body at Moria, and he could use a, a, a shadow to reanimate it. So it's not not like we'll never see Absalom again. Um, Perona, nothing really new about Perona. We actually find out a lot more about Kumashi than anything. And Kumashi is not spelled with S-H-I, like she, as in death. No, it's literally the letter C. Kuma C. And this leads to a theory that the first toy she had when she was a little girl that Kuma C is modeled after was Kuma A. And there was also a Kuma B in between. Like, get it? Kuma A, B, and C. Okay. It's not like it matters, but there you go. Her devil fruit is extremely powerful. It's pretty much effective on anybody. Even somebody uh, as like optimistic as Luffy, it can render immobile. So, unless you have somebody that's as pessimistic as Usopp, which does not come along very often, um, yeah, Perona's fruit will pretty much just uh, knock you down for at least a few seconds. Um, Sindri was the daughter of nobility from the West Blue. Makes sense, because Moria and Hogback and everybody originated from the West Blue. Hogback, I, I don't think there's any information on Hogback. I don't think we learned anything new about him, no. But Hogback, of course, had that obsession of Sindri, had the pictures of her all over um, his room. And, you know, that's something about One Piece that really gets overlooked. I might just do a whole video about her when we get to Halloween. I was also going to do a Thriller Bark, Geography is Everything, when we get to October. Um... But, you know, that whole thing with Sindri, they didn't expand upon it too much, but the whole thing where she was this famous, like, dancer, and then she died in a tragic accident, and Hogback at first, like, it seemed like he was just had, like, an unrequited love sort of deal, but Hogback was just really messed up to the point where he reanimates her to be basically just his, you know, uh, assistant that'll do whatever he says, that's really messed up, and that's a really tragic story for a character. So, I might touch upon that more, of just, like, the themes of that and everything. Because it was such an interesting part of it, you know? Like, when Nami and uh, Chopper and Usopp were exploring Hogback's mansion, and they stumble upon that room, that really creepy room with all of her pictures and the newspaper clippings and everything. Like, that kind of lend a little bit of, like, a mystery, kind of, like, detective subgenre to the Thriller Bark arc. It doesn't really go anywhere, but then that one, you know, chapter where they see that room, they're like, oh, a mystery is afoot here, Scooby, you know, and it doesn't really go anywhere major, and I'm happy that the person that had her shadow removed, Margaret, you know, that got put in Sindri, got, you know, back to her by the end of the arc, and also that tearful moment between Sindri and Chopper when they were fighting Hogback, although I wish, I wish Chopper would have just decimated Hogback in that fight. They were interrupted by oars, but yeah, that would have been a cool thing. But yeah, I'll do probably a whole video on Sindri. I think it's warranted. Uh, speaking of oars, I mentioned the retcon of his height, but it was stated that oars created a country of ruffians back in the day, and the way that country is used here is, seems to be indicating it was Wano. Now, here's the thing. 
even though Oda buffed up his height to 67 uh, meters, not 67 feet, 67 meters, that doesn't seem like big enough to tow an entire island. We've seen how big, like, it took Big Mom and everybody riding that giant land crocodile shark thing, it took them, like, over a day to traverse the Curry region and the Udon region. Like, these areas of Wano are, like, probably hundreds of miles wide. Maybe even more than that. Like, I don't think a 67... That's pretty damn tall, but 67 meters, I mean... I guess this is one piece you could just say that Ors was redonkulously, you know, strong. But, you look at Onigashima, and you see that the Skull Mountain on Onigashima looks like an ancient giant. By the way, we got a name for Ors' species. I think it was mentioned before, but it is, just to be stated ancient giant okay so that's that also uh rock and scotch who were the yeti cool brothers were referred to as mysterious giants as their actual like sub race of giants so keep that in mind for later but yeah if that skull mountain was not just a rock formation if it was an actual skull from an actual ancient giant that was like you know its head alone was like the size of an island then okay i could get i could believe that thing if it existed would have created wano the other option here is that Ors had other ancient giants helping him back then they all towed the islands together with their immense strength but that doesn't really answer the question of the giant skull on Onigashima, so keep that in mind. Oh, here's something. Maybe Onigashima was always there. Maybe Onigashima was like the resting ground of like the big boss ancient giant, like the god ancient giant back in the day. And then maybe because of that island, Ors and the other ancient giants in their time, like over 500 years ago, decided to tow a bunch of islands together to make Wano. Also, if this was the case, and there were, like, legitimate, like, yokai and just wild beasts living on the island back when Ors just created it, or Ors's band created it, that might lead into, like, a yokai species still living on Wano. That's why people in Wano were so superstitious. Because back in the day, monsters really did exist, maybe using humans as slaves, and then throughout the years, those monsters died off, or the humans fought back, picked up swords, and the country took over as, like, a human, you know, uh, island. But... They'll never forget that fear that those demons, like, imposed on them. So, yeah, a lot of stuff about Ors. Then we got Ryuma. Ryuma was also known as the Legendary Samurai, the Sword God, or Frozen Moon Ryuma, or Shimosuke Ryuma. Now, Shimosuke is not a surname. It is the same name as the village in the East Blue where Koshiro set up the Ishin Dojo that trained Zoro and Kuina. And it's also the last name of Yasuie, Yasuie Shimosuke. It means Frost Moon. Um, so, few things here. Um, Koshiro might have named the village he founded after Ryuma because of his title, because Ryuma was the sword god of Wano. And Yasuie, his last name, maybe if Yasuie is not like related to Ryuma, it might have been somebody that, you know, like like back in the day, they picked up his like title as a surname and just continued with it because Ryuma lived like 400 years ago. Maybe after Ryuma died, Yasuie's uh, ancestors decided to take the surname of Shimosuke, and that's why Yasuie's name is that. Not really sure, but it doesn't seem to be Ryuma's like last name. It's just his title here. Uh, he was born in Ringo, and that's actually where he was buried. We know that from Gyuki Maru, like the, the Seven Swordsman guy. He's the one that was trying to retrieve Shusui and bring it back to the tomb of Ryuma. Actually, no, he did succeed. He did return it to the tomb. That's when Zoro showed up and tried to retrieve it from him. And then that's when uh, Kamazo, who's killer, showed up and, you know, distracted him and attacked him and everything got messed up there. But yeah, right now, Shusui is resting in Ryuma's tomb, which is located in the Ringo region. Now, um, one more thing, and that's one more thing, and that's... That's related to um, the whole slaying a dragon deal. All right. So if you've read Monsters, which is Oda's one shot, that has a character named Ryuma. He slays a dragon. I don't think Oda is taking every little aspect of that Monsters one shot and making it canon. I think of it like this. Monsters is like its own little thing. 
but Ryuma and the dragon, those elements from monsters are part of One Piece. Oda's just going to have to rework the way they, they are set up a little bit. Because in the monsters one shot, like, there was like a, like a, like a Spanish conquistador kind of dude. And he looked like Mihawk in it. So, like, probably not a character that actually came from Wano. But it was stated here that the dragon that he slew, it, it, he did it in the middle of the flower capital. Like, a dragon was attacking the capital. Might have been a dragon that was controlled by a celestial dragon back in the day. Celestial dragon had a dragon. Hey, dragon, let's fly to Wano and let's take it over in the name of the world government. And the dragon came down and Ryuma's like, oh, not on my watch. Shing, sliced him down. Dragon head fell. Dragon meat for days, weeks, months in Wano. And that celestial dragon basically got the message and was like, all right, yeah, Wano is its own isolated thing. That's the series of events that I am going to take away from this. But yeah, um, yeah, I think that's everything involving Ryuma though. Uh, do not underestimate his relevance to the story, at least to the Wano arc. Okay, he is going to be a major figure later on. I wouldn't be surprised if we got a flashback, like a few f pages of flashback for Ryuma. Might be kind of difficult, because we're talking about something that happened 400 years ago. We're definitely going to get a flashback of stuff that happened 20 years ago during the takeover of Wano and like Odin's time and everything like that. We've yet to see Odin yet. I'm, I'm assuming Oda is going to reveal Odin's like character, like what he looks like during that flashback. But yeah, we should definitely get a flashback of Ryuma. I think it's deserved at this point with how much hype it's been built up. Uh, Edward Weevil. You want to guess what his weak point is? Because it spells it out right here. His legs. That's right. His upper body's pretty buff, but he skips leg day. You can't skip leg day. That reminds me way too much of that episode of Teen Titans Go. You know, the weird leg fetishist one? Uh, you know which one I'm talking about, because there's two, but you know which one I'm talking about. Um, this is why whenever he acts up or Bakin wants to discipline him, he, I mean, she smacks him in his legs. And so he's like, oh, mama, why'd you do that? You know? So, um, if they ever fight Weevil, I mean, if they can get through his, like, huge, like, swipes of his, uh, giant bicento, if they can just target his legs, if Frankie could just take weapons left and just bombard him and just hit his legs, I mean, oh, that hurt, you skinned my knee, then I guess that's how they take down Edward Weevil, I guess. Um, his legs are his weak point. Um, two years ago, after hearing the death of Whitebeard, he swore revenge. So, Weevil is, you know, he, he's a few sandwiches short of a good picnic, alright? He actually legitimately believes everything that his mother says. His mother says he's the son of Whitebeard, he just goes along with that, he just naturally assumes that, okay? Weevil himself is not really a bad guy. All right, I want that to be stated. He's he's a he's an idiot. All right, he's a complete freaking gibbering idiot moron. All right, um, he wants to avenge his father because his mother told him that Whitebeard was his dad. So his first reaction to hearing his father's death was, "I'm gonna find Blackbeard and I'm gonna beat the crap out of him," which is a good thing. You know, can you imagine Weevil fighting Blackbeard? I mean, I'm sure he's strong enough to give White, I mean, to give Blackbeard and his crew a little bit of trouble if he ever made it to their island. However, Bakin doesn't care about Teach. He doesn't care about, you know, Whitebeard's death or who killed him or anything like that. All she's after is the money out of the moolah. You know, she wants to find Whitebeard's inheritance. So that's why Bakin is ordering Weevil to go around and destroying all of uh, Whitebeard's allies, like the A&O pirates. That's the reason he's doing that. Think of him as a man-child. He just doesn't know better, all right? He's the IQ of, like, 50, all right? But... Just on his own, if if his mother were to be taken out of the picture, he might actually you know, not be such a bad guy. Might even end up being an ally in the long run. Um, there's some extra information on the fire tank pirates, Vito and Goatee, but the most important thing about them is that Vito's bounty was 95 million and Goatee's was 90. Uh, Vito, remember, is the dude that uh, had the giant hands that was the German double six fanboy, and Goatee was a combatant on the fire tank pirates. They both are, same rank as Zoro is on the Straw Hat crew. He's the one that had that giant, like, machine gun on his arm. So, or, like, a prosthetic that actually is a machine gun. He pulls the chain and, like, da-da-da-da-da. Those were those guys. Not really super super important characters, but we got bounties, so I thought I'd mention it. Oh, by the way, we also got Lola's bounty. It's uh, 24 million. So once again, just, just an information, just something to, you know, throw out there. Um, okay, so now we have Kuma, because Kuma also got revealed on Thriller Bark. Like I said, we got a lot of characters in this one, though. There's not too many left. Okay, so um, Sorbet Kingdom. 
where Bonnie or Connie was apparently the Queen Dowager of. Uh, that's located in the South Blue, which is the same sea of origin for Jewelry Bonnie. Okay, there's a connection there. He apparently was given the name Tyrant before he ever became a pirate, before he probably even became a member of the Revolutionary Army. He most likely received that title Tyrant back when he was still the king. All right. I want you to think about this when it comes to Kuma. This is such a fascinating character, okay? Kuma, from what we know of, at different points in his life, he was a king, a pirate, a member of the Revolutionary Army, a robot, and now currently, you know, a you know, member of the Warlords, member of, you know, the, the world government as a robot. But he was like part of every faction in one piece pretty much like royalty revolutionary army pirates and the world government who are connected to the marines at some point in his life this dude's story is probably the most tragic <laughs> out of everything okay how to piece this together well right now we just have no idea but the way i'm gonna look at it is maybe this let's say kuma started off in royalty he became a king he wasn't the nicest king that's why he got the nickname Tyrant. They don't give you the nickname Tyrant because you're a nice guy, all right? So let's say at some point he met somebody that changed his life. Maybe it was Bonnie. Maybe it was just like maybe a child in the kingdom. Something that changed his viewpoints of the world. Something that wanted him to, you know, change the way he was. And then he maybe went out to sea to be a pirate or just to join the Revolutionary Army. I guess it's possible he might not have been a pirate. Because if he was a member of the Revolutionary Army, maybe the government would have just viewed him as a pirate. Um, but if that's the case, if he was a member of the Revolutionary Army, does the world government know he was a member? Because that's weird. That doesn't seem like they would ever accept him as a member of the Warlords if they knew he was connected to the Revolutionary Army. Maybe he went cruel king, then joined the Revolutionary Army. Maybe he had a change of heart by somebody. Joined the Revolutionary Army. Then... Dragon told him to go undercover as a pirate, become a pirate, get infamy, world government notices him, joins the warlords, gets some backdoor into that, gets some information from them, gets turned into a PX0, but if Vegapunk is working for the Revolutionary Army, programs some stuff in there to, like, you know, uh, attack them when their back's down or something like that, um... Yeah, that might be the way it went. Kuma's backstory, is, is it's going to be expounded upon at some point, but man, there are just so many aspects, so many little footnotes to this guy. It's in, it's insane. But the, the funniest thing for me is his favorite foods, which are honey and salmon, because he's a bear. Do you get it? That's funny. All right, we got some information on Hack. He's not important. Uh, Bastille, I already brought that up. You know, he used to be considered a giant, but no longer. Uh, the reason why he wears the mask is because he has, like, surgical scars on his face. But, okay, whatever. Whatever for him. Haridus. Okay, Haridus is 97 years old, and he was born in Burka. Yeah, Burka. The same place that Eneru was born and subsequently destroyed. Now, of course... Eneru was way younger than Haridus, so he was born in that Sky Island a very, very long time ago, and he left at actually the age of 15, 82 years ago, to study the science of weather. When he was 30 years old, they founded or built the Sky Island weather area, so it was artificially created. They probably just, you know, took some island cloud together, you know, threw it all the way together, added some pinwheels and everything, and then there you go. You basically had a mobile research station that just floated on the wind. So there you go. Um, and then a year after they built with area, that's when they began their like worldwide adventure, you know, traveling, studying all kinds of weather patterns all over the Grand Line and the Four Blues. Um, that was Haridus's goal. So yeah, born on Bricka, probably not super relevant. Like, I don't know if we're ever going to get a backstory involving Bricka, like a flashback or anything, but same place Eneru was born, you know, and just because Eneru was born there doesn't mean like it's a place of a bunch of like rowdy, you know, uh, warriors or anything. It, it might have had more warriors warriors there than the standard like Angel Island or something, but it might have just been a regular island, and then Eneru was just born there, and then when he got his powers of the Goro Goro no Mi, maybe to, to test his powers, he took his followers from Berka, the ones that were the most loyal to him, and then just, you know, nuked the island just because he could, and then he left, and just to show his power. When he arrived at Angel Island in Upper Yard, he's like, ah, behold my powers as your new god. By the way, you know that island Berka back there? Yeah, you don't anymore. And so the people were just afraid of him from what he did and then that's why they followed him so yeah 
Uh, Blue Jam Pirates. Nobody cares. But Porchimi's bounty was 3.4 million. You know, the guy that tied up Ace in the backstory. And Blue Jam's bounty was 14.3 million. Did I say it was the Porchimi Pirates or the Blue Jam Pirates? And he was the Port Blue Jam Pirates. All right. Finally time for my favorite character. You saved, well, beyond Carrot. Carrot is like, when I say favorite character, you have to understand, Carrot's on like a whole different pedestal, okay? But we got Heracleson. There's a little bit thing about Kong at the very end, but, you know, Kong is not really, nothing that we don't already know, okay? He's the commander-in-chief, whatever. He controls all the different, like, the Marines, the Warlords, the Cypher Pools. We already knew that. Okay, Heracleson, his backstory. Are you ready for this? I know I am. All right, so he was born in the South Blue, maybe in the Sorbet Kingdom. Probably not. He's 51 years old, and he is a botanist. And it makes sense because he was on the Boeing Archipelago, um, you know, studying and discovering all these different kinds of flora and all that stuff. And it's told here how he ended up on that island, okay? So back in his youth, he was just an aspiring botanist, uh, probably didn't wear the beetle armor back then, and him and a bunch of other botanists left their island in the South Blue, went into the Grand Line to just study plants. Yeah, that means they weren't pirates, you know, they weren't enemies of the world government, they weren't like Pedro's crew trying to discover the mystery of the Poneglyphs or anything, they were just biologists studying plants. I love this because this adds a whole new layer of uh, intrigue into the story, like, you know, there's, there's more groups of people out there than just pirates and marines and revolutionary army and people like that, like, there's just regular scientists, like people that study the weather and people that study, um, you know, plants, and they, yet they still travel into really dangerous situations for their study study for their craft. I love that stuff. Not everybody that travels into the Grand Line is there to find the One Piece. Some people just want to go to study the strange weather patterns or the weird plant life or animals or stuff like that. I love that kind of stuff, you know? So this is the way I think it went down on Heracles' end, okay? So 23 years ago, no, 25 years ago, he lands on the Boeing Archipelago with a bunch of his colleagues, okay? Just one year later, all of his colleagues are wiped out because of the uh, conditions on the island. The um, Boeing Archipelago was made up of a bunch of different forests. There was the Swindling Forest, Glenstone. I should do a Geography is Everything on that. In fact, I totally am now, uh, now that we've got more information on it, right? Um, but there's the Gluttony Forest that has all that food that, you know, keeps you to stay there to get fat. The islands are not really islands. They're actually plants themselves. Uh, Stomach Baron, I think, is the actual name of the plant, which, in fact, Heracles might have actually given it the name Stomach Baron. And so the plants are like, you know, they, they just uh, scoop up the uh, plants and other like animals on the island, just eat them for nourishment. So here's what I think happened, though. After that year, when they were on the island and everybody else on his crew got wiped out, I'm assuming he was probably stuck on the island for a little while. Uh, kind of similar to how Brooke was stuck on his ship for a while, but whereas Brooke was just lonely because there was nobody attacking him while he was floating aimlessly in the Florian Triangle, um, Heracles was probably too distracted by the giant plants trying to eat him on a daily basis to really be worried about being lonely. So at first, I'm sure it was rough on his end, traveling the jungle, but I think after a few years, Years, he just all went up like Tom Hanks and cast away with this like he figured out a way to survive He knew which forests to avoid and which ones would provide food which plants to eat uh, Which animals were safe and that actually could be tamed. He figured out how pop greens worked um, He probably killed a beetle or something and fashioned that cool armor, you know and everything like that and he just started living there and just kept on studying what he, you know, what he came there to do to study the different plants and everything like that. Um, Heracles was not stuck on that island. He could have left whenever he wanted because by the time Usopp showed up and they trained together for two years, how they got back to Sabaody was they rode on these giant beetles. They got these giant beetles that they tamed, Heracles and probably tamed them, and then they used their wings to just fly to Sabaody. And then after the adventure there, after Usopp reunited with the crew, Heracles got back on his beetle and they just flew off into the ocean. So Heracles could have left the island whenever he wanted and went back to the South Blue in theory, but he just figured like, yeah, nah, I'm just going to stick on the island. I mean, that's what I came here to do. That is dedication to your craft, sir. I am very appreciating that you caring about plants and...
I love the way Heracles and talks, okay? Uh, also, by the way, when he was on his way, it was even mentioned in the cover page when we see him on, you know, the ocean traveling. He's like, hasn't yet returned to the Boeing archipelago yet. That's when he was reading the newspaper about Usopp's exploits and everything uh, back on the crew. So I like to think he's treating it more of like a vacation. Like, ah, oh, yes, I'll, I will return to the Boeing archipelago one day and discover some new plants and, you know, continue my research. But I deserve a, a vacation. I've been working too hard lately. Uh, oh, there's a giant... Uh, uh, you know, cruise ship that's also an island that's also a casino. I'll stop there for a little while. Film Gold cameo! I'm actually really upset by that Film Gold cameo. Of, I mean, I love seeing Hercules in, but of all the characters to have a cameo, why him? I would have loved for Heracles to see Usopp in the casino and being like, Oh, Usoppin, I'm glad our paths in could reunite in. I will help you fight against this guild to Zoroin. And then, you, you know, you could have freaking Heracles and Usopp team up in the movie and fight against one of the enemies, the phasing dude or the lucky girl with the big boobs. They could have had, um, Baccarat, that was her name. They could have had Heracles and an Usopp team up together to use pop greens to take her down, man. That would have been awesome. Like, Usopp fired the shot, you know, into the, you know, the, uh, uh, slot machine thing, and that's how he ended up winning against her, draining all of her luck, and then Heracles in shows up at the last minute and fires off, a, like, an explosive grass pop green. That would have been great, but no, he was just in the background. He was on the same island. It's just Usopp and him never met. They never ran across each other. You know, chance encounters, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, I love that backstory for Heracles and man. He is dedicated to his craft, 51 years old and living on an island all by himself just studying plants. But, hey, man, that's what he does. That is what he was born to do. All right, so that's everybody. That's a, that was a long pack, like I said. That took me about an hour. Um, next time, we got the last of the, uh, scheduled packs, the first batch. When the Vivera cards were first announced last year, they had, like, a chart. Like, okay, February, March, May, June, July, August, these are all the packs. The August pack was the last one. We're gonna get the German Double Six and the Charlotte Family's packs, okay? I'm assuming we're not gonna get cards for every single member of the family. Who knows? This is the last one that was announced, so maybe we will. But that doesn't mean it's the last one total. In fact, I actually talked to Artur about this, and he is such a nice guy, everybody. If you haven't had a chance to talk to Artur, he's such a nice dude. Um, I was uh, messaging him about the Zunisha video, just confirming some facts about Zunisha. Such a nice guy. He sent me, like, a bunch of pages relating to Zunisha, and we talked about it and everything, figuring out the height and all that stuff. Um, and I brought that up to him. I was like, oh, man, it really sucks that we're running out of Evera cards soon. And he's like, oh, no, no, they've already announced more packs. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So, I mean, there's a bunch of new characters. Like, Oda can just take a bunch of random characters that were never given names or backstories and just gives them names and backstories. I am totally fine with that, all right? But, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. This is already a long video, so I'm going to be getting off here now. But uh, remember, carrot is love, carrot is life. You think you could stop the storm. But you can't. It's gonna be a bunny storm coming up in here. Yeah. I know your secret. Oh my god, it's a little baby bunny. Oh my god, it's the most adorable thing I've ever met in my life. <laughs> You're so cute. I almost stepped on you. Oh my god, you gotta be careful, little baby bunny. I, I kind of just want to scoop you up and bring you back home, but um, that might start off a uh, that might start off a problem where I own a lot of rabbits. So um, you know, uh, good luck, little rabbit. Uh, this is a big field here, so uh, you can make your hippity hops, and um, I would recommend hiding before before the night comes. There are these things called owls, and they're, uh, they're not very nice to you. So, uh, be, be safe, little bunny. Can, can, I, can, I, can I touch you? Oh, crap! <laughs>